So far in the book of Acts, we have seen the rapid spread of the good news of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior to anybody who believes in him and trusts in him for the forgiveness of their sins. Starting in chapter one, you see, if you can remember all the way back there, Jesus uh, told his disciples that they were gonna be witnesses, witnesses starting in Jerusalem, which they were, of course, and then in Judea, and that was the rest of the country. That caused, well, incredible growth amongst Jewish people. They were also to go to Samaria, and those were the close cousins of the Jews, of course. And then they were to go to the ends of the earth. Now, along the way, it, well, it's really been a surprise to them, hasn't it? Uh, that this would include non-Jews. And what seems obvious to us now was only really dawning on them. Now, they've had to deal with the huge implications of what it means to have different people from different cultures and different backgrounds integrate with Jews, with Gentiles, with their friends. The ministry, well, it has been close to Judea and countries close to, the, to Judea right up until this point. Um, but in the second missionary journey, Luke, of course, our author, is going to arrive on the scene. And you'll notice that through the change from they language to we language, and then back again to they language at the end of the chapter. And it helps us to see how God is moving them into, well, increasingly Roman territory. You'll also notice the use of the word Rome or Roman or, or um technical terminology um, from the Romans throughout this chapter. He wants us to understand, you see, that the gospel is arriving in a very different part of the world, a really very Roman dominated part of the world that we would just call Europe nowadays. How will the gospel fare in the most powerful civilization known at the time? How, how, how will we see that the gospel is actually for everybody? Well, I'm Andrew and welcome to our talk time. Okay, well, let's read, of course. We always start by reading, don't we? Let's read Acts 16 and verse six through to the end of verse 34. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they'd come up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately he sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So setting off, setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace and the following day to Neapolis and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days and on the Sabbath day we went outside, to the gate, outside the gate to the riverside where we supposed there was a place of prayer and we sat down and spoke to the women who'd come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshipper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized and her household as well, she urged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when the owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they'd brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in attacking them and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. 
And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the fountains of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke, to, spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he was baptised at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he'd believed in God. Well, you can clearly see in verses 6 to 10 that somehow, and really it would only be conjecture to say, they find the doors of God, of God closed by God. And the Holy Spirit. Of course, famously, they do find direction with the vision of the man from Macedonia. Uh, can you imagine how confused they must be? And I'll just put up a map for you as well so that you can see just the area that he would have passed by in order to get to Troas. Well, I mean, we'd be confused. We'd be confused in the same situation if we had plans and we wanted to do something, but we find dead ends everywhere. I mean, I have to admit, the first thing that comes into my mind when I think about that is our building plans. And I don't want to go down that rabbit hole, but certainly as a result, the conclusion in verse 10 was that God must be calling them to a different place. We'll try not to read too much into that for our own situation with the building, but certainly we can experience that when we have plans but they don't seem to go the way we want to but God opens up a new way for us to travel. Well the triumph of this chapter of course the rest of this chapter is that Jesus is well and truly for everyone and that Jesus is victorious over all. We'll see this over and over in the next chapters because, you see, on this second missionary journey, we're going to find Paul and his team, of course, penetrating further and further into Europe and meeting people along the way who are going to come to faith in Jesus as Lord and Saviour. And it'll not be without opposition, but we've come used to that, of course. But over and over, we're going to see the triumph of Jesus. Now, there wasn't a synagogue, apparently, in Philippi. Apparently, you needed 10 Jewish males in order for a synagogue to be formed. Um, these Jews and these God-fearers met by water. Uh, of course, they'd gone there to pray. It was the Sabbath day. But also, it might have been water would have been necessary for traditional uh, washing routines and, and traditions. Um, and so that's where Paul goes and he preaches. Now we meet the first of our characters who becomes a Christian, and that's Lydia. And Lydia is a businesswoman. She sells the most expensive colour of cloth because purple was only something that you could extract from sea snails in order to get that dye that could dye the clothes. So Lydia was selling clothes that were really only for the richest or for royalty. And she's a God worshipper which stops short of calling her a, a Jew, but certainly means that she doesn't worship all the different Roman or Greek gods that there were. See, maybe she's more like Cornelius in that respect. But God is moving, for it is God who opens up her heart to understand what Paul is saying. And so she pays attention. And then, of course, in the act of baptism, well, we have to understand that she has opened her heart to God. She believes in Jesus, she asks for forgiveness, and she makes Jesus her Lord and her Saviour. 
And so immediately we find her putting her resources at the disposal of these missionaries. And at the end of the chapter, even, we find Paul and the team returning to Lydia's house. You'll see that when we read it before they move on, which strongly suggests that Lydia's house is fast becoming a base for the Philippian church to start in. Now, we aren't given the time frame, but the next person that we meet is a slave girl who is possessed. So we move from one of the wealthiest to one who was the absolute bottom of the heap. She's in poverty. She is somebody's property. She's abused psychologically, spiritually. She's oppressed. She's exploited. She's owned. She is in the grips of not only an evil spirit, but also of evil men who care about nothing but their own profits. Uh, they care about that more than her welfare. It seems a little strange that Paul, Silas and Luke are disturbed by this spirit in the girl saying the truth. Um, listen to these people. Yet from our first missionary journey, you might remember the need to distance the real Jesus from bar Jesus and to distance the work of the Holy Spirit from magic. And maybe there's as much this desire to distance Christianity from the satanic work as much as it is to free this girl from her torment. As grieved as Paul is by the sight, it is Jesus the Lord, the anointed king who delivers this girl. Wonderful to see. And we aren't told by Luke whether she's saved or not, but it's hard to imagine that if, um, of all the people that Luke chooses to tell us about in Philippi that become Christians, we have one chance healing between two very obvious conversions and that didn't lead to this little girl's conversion. I'm sure we could probably assume that this girl becomes a Christian too. And so from Lydia, the Thyre Tyron, and what is now from what would now be modern day Turkey to this slave girl who could easily have been from another country, of course, um, and hence being a slave in wealth as well as in social status, maybe even race. We're already seeing that Jesus is for everybody. And of course, well, this leads to the last of the people that we are introduced to in this section, and it's the jailer. As Paul and Silas are dragged before these Roman officials, these magistrates, they just want a, a quick disciplining and teach them a lesson, chuck them in jail for a little bit. And these stocks that are mentioned, by the way, would have probably contorted their bodies. It wouldn't be the kind of stocks that we think about from medieval times here in Great Britain. Um, but they're given a severe beating with rods, not just a little bit of a beating and scuff them up a bit and throw them in prison. Um, and then you see these horrible things that the, these evil owners say. First of all, they say Paul and Silas are Jews and so they play this race card. But then they say that they're disturbing the city and so they play the unobstantiated accusation card. And then they say that they're advocating uh, unlawful practices for us Romans. And so they're playing like a superiority card here. So Paul and Silas are jailed. I mean, does this mean that going from such a, an amazing experience with Lydia and, and all of these resources put at their disposal, now they're in jail, is the gospel finished? Is that it? No more gospel sharing. Well, this of course is where we meet the last character that we're introduced to here in Philippi. He's probably a retired military or, 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 um, or, or ex-soldier. Uh, he, the jailer that, that, that we find out is, is hearing things that he wouldn't necessarily have expected to hear. He's hearing happy prisoners singing and praying. He hears honest prisoners who haven't escaped even though their shackles have come off and they are completely free after this earthquake hits. Um, they didn't escape. He, he finds caring prisoners who know that he would kill himself if the prisoners escaped because he would be held accountable. No wonder this man throws himself down at the feet of Paul and Silas and asks how to be saved. He knows that he needs what they have. He knows that they are innocent and he is not. He is aware that he is a sinful man. And we can only imagine that Paul and Silas's prayers have been full of glorifying God and rejoicing in his salvation. He's heard this and now he really wants it. What does the jailer have to do? 
What does a jailer have to do to be saved? It's what every single one of us has to do in order to be saved. And that is to trust in the Lord Jesus. To believe in Jesus means not trusting in ourselves, not what we often try to do ourselves. And that is trust that we are good enough for God because we think that we're really nice people or trust that we have done more good than we've done bad or trust that we're not as bad as such and such a person um, that we conjure in our minds as being the, the most evil and bad person. Anyone who wants to be saved from their sin or saved from hell has to trust in Jesus as saviour, not themselves. In verse 32, you might notice that Paul takes more time to explain to this man and his family the word of the Lord. And that's great because it helps us to realise, yes, you might get it from just one simple sentence. Just believe in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. But actually, there's so much more richness that would really help somebody to know that they're making a wise and a good decision and counting the cost of what it is to follow Jesus. So Paul takes more time. And then we find this jailer washing Paul and Silas's wounds. And then he himself is washed in baptism. That's that amazing outward sign of the washing away of sin that he has prayed for. Wonderful to see this. Isn't it just marvellous? In the first place where God directs Paul and Silas, this missionary team to go to, this Roman city of Philippi, we have a wealthy lady, a poor slave girl and a jailer. Different in wealth, in race, in previous religious background, in socioeconomic and cultural status, all receiving Jesus as Lord and as Saviour. Let me contrast this with the pious prayers found in various forms in the Talmud. Blessed are you, Lord, our God, creator of the universe, who has not created me a woman, a Gentile, a slave, or an ignoramus. Here in Philippi, we have a woman, we have a Gentile, we have a slave. Now, isn't that interesting? And what about what Paul says in the book of Colossians, a letter to the Colossian Christians when referring to those who've been saved, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave or free. Or to the Galatians, um, talking about their salvation, there's no Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, when it comes to salvation. All of those things, of all the people that Luke brings out, of all the things that happened in his time in Philippi, this is exactly what we find. Jesus is for everyone. But of course, Jesus is victorious over all too. So let's read 35 to 49. But when it was day, the magistrates sent the police saying, let those men go. And the jailer reported these words to Paul saying, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. But Paul said to them, they have beaten us publicly, uncondemned men who are Roman citizens and have thrown us into prison. And do they now throw us out secretly? No, let them come themselves and take us out. The police reported these words to the magistrates and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. So they came and apologized to them and they took them out and asked them to leave the city. So when they went out, uh, when they went out of the prison and visited Lydia, and when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and departed. Look at the backtracking that Paul has these magistrates, these Roman magistrates do. They might have hoped for quick lessons to be learned and these troublemakers would be on their way again, but background information confirms that Roman citizens were never to be punished without a trial, which is exactly what happened to Paul and Silas. These magistrates have done something which is illegal. They could be punished for breaking the law. Now, why does this matter? Why should we hear about this? Well, couldn't Paul and Silas have just moved on quietly? And well, look back at verse 22. The public punishment of these men was wrong, especially when it was unsubstantiated. How was Christianity going to survive or even flourish if those who represented it were associated with troublemaking or deserving to be thrown in prison? 
and starting uprisings. What kind of future would Christianity have had? You see, in the same way that the need to distance Jesus from occultism was made, um, they need to distance from these false claims too. The church in Philippi has been planted by people of integrity, Roman citizens too. And in much the same way that Timothy's circumcision would be useful for silencing unnecessary criticism, so too this Roman citizenship and the right way of upholding the law would be useful for silencing unnecessary criticism. Jesus is victorious here because his servants are cleared of the charges and receive their apology. Now, if only that were the case every time. We know all too well that Christians are falsely accused or beaten or imprisoned or shamed. We can just think about Asia Bibi um, from Pakistan or Abel Masi in, in Egypt uh, or the many others who fall foul to blasphemy accusations or honour killings. Some have to flee. Some lose their lives. We trust that God has the vengeance and that he will repay. There is ultimate justice in Jesus who will repay everyone according to their deeds. And yet here in this chapter, as the gospel confronts the might of Roman civilization in his name, the demon oppressed are freed. The message is freed. The church is established. Meeting in Lydia's house where Paul and Silas encourage the brothers, that family of believers, before departing. And this should remind us of our own situation too. You see, too often the church is accused of being, well, just for middle class people, full of people who live comfortably and turn up to church in their nice cars. But Jesus is for everyone. Now, it might be easier for us to share Jesus with people who are like us or people who are like you, similar in background or with similar interests. And we might start there, but we must never end there. There is no barrier to who can have their heart opened by the Holy Spirit of God to leave behind one life and embrace Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour. Let's never prejudge a person according to our own standards or preferences in order to decide who we share our homes with or our lives with or the gospel with. Let's learn from Paul and Silas singing and praying, even when they should have been groaning or deflated or complaining to God after doing their best for him. I'm really inspired by this. And I, I'm just finding out more recently by a famous Christian who suffered um, in Romania. He's called Richard Wurmbrand, founder of Voice of the Martyrs Ministry, who endured torture and prison, yet shared his faith and even praised God in all of it. Now, this isn't biblical optimism that we're talking about. This is an example of how we can live our lives, even in the face of persecution. And if you need prayer in your workplace or your family or your school or your friendship group, we'll invite somebody to come in and pray with you for that. Will you feel put down or despised or things are difficult for you as you navigate the pressures of being a Christian in your um, place? But you also have to remember the glorious truth that Jesus is victorious. Even in the face of the world's superpowers or great thinkers, Jesus is victorious over the world's clever, clever criticisms or the fads of our governments or their agendas. He is victorious over regimes and ideologies so that we should just get on with our work of evangelism. We have to get on with helping people ask the greatest question that can ever be asked. What must I do? to be saved. Let's be prepared to answer that question honestly, simply, truthfully, and ready to give a reason for the hope that we have within us with gentleness and with respect to anyone. And if that's your question, what must I do to be saved? Or you want to, to explore that more, well then come and speak to me or speak to somebody that you know who is a Christian, who shines for Jesus. Um, or if you 
want a loved one that you've really been praying for um, to come to Jesus, then grab somebody and have them pray with you. And lastly, and I say this lovingly, and this is the hard one, uh, Jesus is Lord. Even when you feel like you're trapped or abused or oppressed like that little slave girl, there is freedom in Christ for all. And if you feel trapped and you need prayer and help, please ask someone to walk with you, pray with you and support you. Please get in contact with us if there's anything that we can do for you as a church. Do not carry your burdens alone. He is strong enough to carry you. And that's the job of the church to bear one another's burdens. Shall we pray? Let's pray. Dear Lord, we want to thank you for an amazing chapter. Lord, to see that you are for everyone and to see that you are victorious over all. Lord, two amazing things that can help us today to live for you. Lord, may that be what guides us today, that we might not prejudge and Lord, that we might go in the victorious name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray these things for your honour and for your glory. Amen. Well, once again, thank you so much for watching and look forward to seeing you again next week.